Now we are still with the five hindrances, and that comes to the fourth foundation of mindfulness. So, in other words, mindfulness meditation is not only rising and falling. Remember that it's not only rising and falling. Rising and falling is just the preliminary object to build up our concentration, and if possible. To see the impermanence in the air element, but we have others as well, eh? other bases as well to establish our mindfulness. We have the feelings, we have the mind. We have gone through that. Today we come to the fourth one: dhamma, reality. What is mindfulness of this reality? Wholesome reality, unwholesome reality. Wholesome reality that leads to. Happiness to calmness to insight, unwholesome realities that leads to suffering. So we have to go through them. What are the wholesome realities that we need to practice to develop? What are the unwholesome realities that we have to try to reduce and to cut off so that. They would not obstruct the way to the peacefulness and realization. So, nivarana hindrances. Last week we covered two. Eh? Kama chanta means the attachment or the sense desire. Now, why are they called the hindrances? Why are sense, desire, or attachment called the hindrances to our meditation? Why they obstruct our meditation? Well, the attachment or the sense, desire, which is based on the uh, desire of the sense objects, external, and one that is internal, that is my object. Now the external. Sense desire, just like the uh, nice food, very tasty food that sometimes we are very attached to certain type of food, and if we don't have that certain type of food, then our mind are very disturbed. We can't meditate, especially uh, if you go for intensive meditation. You can see your mind very clearly. Uh, sometimes there are very Uh, meditators who are so attached to the uh, food, and they will complain why uh, today uh, uh, no vegetable, why vegetable so little. They like to eat a lot of vegetables, and so when they see a lot of meat on the table, they feel very irritated, feel very agitated, and so they they can't meditate, it disturb their mind, and the whole day they will feel that their stomach is not satisfied. Because they're very little, bo- very little vegetable, and they come and see me, brother James. Why today they don't cook vegetable? I say, God, 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 vegetable, and not enough, too much meat. Or sometimes they look and say, Why this vegetable? Those who take meat, why all vegetable don't put the the the, the small fish there? And they will make it very tasty, you know. So they complain and complain and complain, and they can't meditate. So that becomes a hindrance. If our sense desire is very strong for taste, well, it does not mean that we live like a monk; we don't enjoy at all. But in a sense that we do not let it become very strong, that it disturbs our meditation, disturbs our progress. As a lay people, of course, we allow to enjoy, but not enjoy in a sense that we harm others and harm ourselves. Try not to kill. In order to enjoy the taste, don't go and uh, order chicken or live fish, so that you enjoy your taste, and therefore you do killing. So, as a Buddhist, we try to abstain from that. We enjoy without harming, eh? uh, not only others but yourself as well. Not because of enjoyment, you eat too much. Now there are some who. Enjoy eating, and and they do not want to get fed, and after that they, they they dig at their throat and and vomit it out. It seems very strange, but a lot of this is going on in the Western place as well as in Singapore and Malaysia as well, because they like to look beautiful, they want to be slim, 
They do not want to be fed, and so they like to eat, but they don't want to be fed. So what happened? So they eat and eat and eat, and they vomit it all out. So that is harming yourself. Or you eat without stopping and get too fat, or you eat all the too much cholesterol. So that is bad. So in other words, as a meditator, we have a fine balance. We see what is enough, what is healthy food, and what is food that causes problem to our body. If we eat too much, then we find it difficult to meditate. We get laziness, especially uh, if we go for a retreat. You eat too much. They say after twelve you cannot eat, so they get worried. So they better eat dinner as well with the lunch together. So one plate, and now they eat two plates. Together for lunch, and then after that they sleep the whole day. Stomach too heavy, and they can't meditate. Every time they sit, they start snoring. So that becomes a hindrance due to craving, due to fear. So you have to watch your mind. Watch your mind is a hindrance. Not only taste, there are other senses as well that cause problem. Uh, like if you are very attached to the comfort of our body, so it's very hard for. Us to go for intensive meditation. Now we covered last week on ill will as well. Ill will, via pada, via pada means ill will. When the mind is very strong, eh, with anger, hatred, remorse, sadness, or anxiety and fear, a mind cannot meditate. So there are many people who meditators. Uh, when I ask, "How is your meditation?" they say. Brother James, I can't meditate for the whole month. I'm so highly disturbed. I say, why are you so highly disturbed? Uh, well, my relative comes and wow, my whole house is upside down, and so I cannot meditate. And some says I have family problem, eh? a lot of quarrelling, so I can't meditate. So uh, make sure that your mind do not get agitated when you have all this ill will and all this anger and frustration. You must learn to see it as my object. Detach. If you don't detach, then you can't meditate, right? So when you have strong attachment, you can't experience the reality. So only when you have mindfulness, then you can experience the taste. It's sweet, sour, or it is uh, bland, or you can when you bite. Then you can experience the nature of the food, hardness and softness. When you swallow, you can experience the air element. So you can experience the reality. In the practice of vipassana, inside the reality of food, as you taste it, as you swallow it. But if you eat it with greed, then you are not aware of anything at all except eat as much as you like. Eh? So. When you have strong attachment to the body feeling as well, then you can't meditate. You can't experience the hardness and the softness. You can't experience the uh, a feeling that arises from your body. Now we are very attached. Humans are very habitual creatures. Habitual. We we sleep on our bed every night, and we want the same bed. If we switch bed, we can't sleep. But they are rare. Eh? People are very rare uh, who can sleep on any bed, anywhere, any place. But generally, we can't. When you sleep in strange places, then uh, we feel very difficult to fall asleep. We must have the ambience. We must have the atmosphere that we are used to every night. Our bed, and some even uh, when they go for retreat, they bring their their own pillow. They can sleep without their own pillow. They must hug their pillow. Then only can sleep. So that is very strange. But yet it is the nature of this mind who is strongly attached. And so without their pillow, the whole day cannot meditate because last night they have no chance to hug the pillow. Very strange, but it is true. And through the interview, I find it very amusing. But it is so. It is so. It is strange how the mind reacts. Very very strange how the mind works. But it boils down simply to attachment, right? Now, ill will too. You must note the mind. Do do not let it become strong. Do not get depressed. Do not be a uh, very strong in anger. Then you find you can't meditate. Then the mind is very disturbed. 
you can't meditate, you can't see rise and fall, you can't see your feelings. Huh? But actually, you, when you, you get very strong anger, you can see your mind very clearly in the practice of mindfulness meditation. But if you were to do tranquility meditation, then it is a big hindrance. But if you were to do mindfulness meditation, actually it is a good object because it's very strong. And you feel very depressed. Watch their feeling. You see their feeling so gripping. You see their feeling so hot. You feel it. You see that the feeling in your mind is really upside down. It is very interesting, actually. When you have that feeling, go to your room. Just close the door and sit and watch that feeling. How you feel when you're depressed. What is that depressed mental state? So, if you bring up your mindfulness and watch it, then it may not be a strong hindrance. Then slowly it disappears, slowly becomes lighter and lighter, and then that feeling of depression disappears. Then you get that calmness. We say that after the storm, you have peace of mind. Sometimes you, you're very disturbed, but after the disturbance disappear, you feel very peaceful. After the heavy rain, you see everything so clean. Phenomena of the mind reacts the same way. Yes. So the Chinese saying that you don't know the salt, you don't know the sweetness. Only when you taste the salt, then you realize how sweet is the other things that you taste. Now, after the disturbance of your mind, if you practice mindfulness and watch it and watch it, as you see it disappear, then you could see that the mind is so peaceful when it is absence or the disappearance of ill will, then the mind becomes so peaceful. So not only do you see the ill will, you also see the disappearance of ill will. The Buddha says that in the teaching, you see the ill will arises, you see the ill will disappearing. So you need to see the beginning and the end of ill will as well. Now we come to the next one. Today we continue with the third one. And that is sloth and topper, tinamida. When sloth and topper are present within the monk's nose, this is sloth and topper in me. Or when sloth and topper are absent within, he knows there is no sloth and topper in me. He knows the arising of sloth and topper comes to be. He knows the discarding of sloth and topper comes to be. He knows the non-arising in the future of discarded sloth and topper comes to be. Now there are five ways that you watch sloth and topper. Five ways of watching sloth and topper. How, what is sloth and topper? How it comes to be? How it disappear? And in future, if you practice correctly, then it will not come to be. It will not appear. Now, what is love and topper? Pali word is dinamida. Dina means sluggishness or dullness of mind. Mida means morbid states of mental formation. So, simply said, it is sloth and topper, laziness, drowsiness, sluggishness, unwellness, or innative state of mind. The mind is not active. So this is what we meant by sloth and topper. But uh, it is a big problem when we meditate. We do experience a lot of this sloth and topper. We just feel lazy. You just cannot meditate. just want to fall asleep. feel so sleepy. You feel your eyelids so heavy. You feel your forehead is so heavy. Eh? It keeps on falling down. You want to go like that. And some of them are, how amazing the forehead can touch the floor. And still they don't fall. They're there slowly. Tuk, 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 until the body can really, eh, the forehead can really touch the floor. And yet they think they're meditating very calm and peaceful. Eh? Very strange. Eh? So uh, it is indeed a, a very strong hindrance uh, in our meditation. Because once we fall asleep, we can't meditate. So... Mindfulness is not there. When this 
mental state arises like this uh, craving and this ill will and this love and topper, there is no mindfulness. Mindfulness cannot coexist, cannot arise together. Uh, one must pass away before the other arise. When there is mindfulness, there is no unwholesome mind. These hindrances cannot arise. But when there is hindrances, there is no mindfulness. So it becomes an obstruction to the mindfulness practice, to bringing out, to develop the mindfulness. So therefore, it is called hindrances or obstruction. He knows sloth and topper absent within. So when you are having sloth and topper, it is a strong hindrance to the development of tranquility meditation. If you practice concentration, meditation, then it is very tough. They do all sorts of things to overcome it. But in the practice of mindfulness meditation, then you take it as an object of your meditation. So, what is this love and topper? Watch it. Then you know, uh, I'm very sleepy. My mind refuses to work. It cannot work. There is less thinking because when you're sloth, the thinking becomes very slow. So, it is the opposite of restlessness where the thinking becomes very fast. It keeps on moving so fast that it becomes a hindrance. It doesn't stay still. So, both becomes too extreme. The one extreme is well, there's no thinking. It is sort of a sense of calmness, but it is not calmness because it is discomfort. Now the comfort, when you have that calmness, it is comfortable, it is alert, it is quiet. But here it is quiet, but it is lazy and heavy. So therefore, it has different characteristics. So you watch that sloth and topper, then you can see the heaviness. And a mind that refused to work, you know, it refused to work. Then you watch it, you know its heaviness. Then you watch these characteristics of sloth and topa. Watch it. Now, if you were to fall asleep, never mind. Let it fall asleep. If not, if you keep on watching it with vitaka, with strong attention, keep putting your mind strongly into the characteristics of this sloth and topa, then suddenly your mind becomes awake and bright. Well, it happens. I've experienced that many, many times. It can be very sloth and, and, and very lazy. But if you persist, you keep on watching it with attention, then the mind brightens up, becomes very clear, and you cannot fall asleep anymore. Then you see things very clearly after it passes away, which I say, after the uh, heavy rain or the gloomy weather, when the clouds hike the sun and when the clouds is blown away by the wind, then the whole sky becomes very bright. Now that is something like the mind. When it's covered up by the uh, laziness, the haziness of mind, then you cannot see clearly. But once it brightens up, then you can see it very clearly. Your rising and falling is very clear. Your feeling is very clear and you can even note your mind. Thinking is very clear. So it's worth the effort to try to overcome your sloth and topper by what do you do? Experience the characteristics of sloth and topper. Experience the heaviness. What is this heaviness of mind? Watch it. What is this sleepiness of mind? Watch it. What is this feeling when you are sloth and topper? Watch it. Right? So when it disappears, the knowing, knowing, watch the disappearing and what comes after disappearing. He knows sloth and topper are absent within. He knows how it comes to be. Now, how do sloth and topper comes to be? Why are you feeling so sleepy when you meditate? Of course, when you're bored, when the object is not interesting, feel bored after you stay your mind there, rising, falling, rising, falling, and the energy is not there. Then you get bored, then you feel sleepy. Then mental and physical fatigue. When you're tired, when you do too much thinking in your work, when you exercise too much, before you come for meditation, when you feel tired mentally and physically, when you meditate, you feel fatigued, you feel sloth and topper. Lack of sleep, when you don't have enough sleep, 
especially those who go for retreat. And when they don't have enough sleep, toss and turn at night because they miss their mattress, miss their rooms. And the next morning when they wake up early, they're not used to wake up so early. So when they wake up early, then they can't meditate the whole morning. Uh, the only thing they do is sleeping. Eh? Cannot meditate at all. Eh? So lack of sleep. So you have to sleep early. Make sure you sleep well. Too much food before you meditate. Don't eat too much. Especially lunchtime. If you want to meditate during afternoon, eat. I always think half the stomach full is enough. The Buddha says uh, three quarter. And the last quarter, fill it up with water. But the modern food man says that you don't fill up your stomach with water. You eat and only after eating half an hour, then you drink water. Uh, that is the modern science. But the Buddha, olden science. <laughs> so you eat three quarter, then fill a quarter up with water. Then you feel that's enough. Some people like to eat food with coffee. Huh? They, they make sure they have one cup of coffee with the food. Or sometimes two cups. So they balance it with water. Then they won't eat too much. Then they feel very drowsy when they meditate. Now sickness, if you're not well physically, affects the mind. Affects your meditation if you're not physically strong. Right? Or when you're sick. But you can still meditate. Don't think that when you're sick, you can't meditate. When you're sick, it is good to meditate. If you keep your mind pure and calm, uh, then uh, uh, your body built up a very strong resistance. You, you recovered faster. But then, but then, you do experience weak mental state, sloth and topper, right? But it doesn't matter, you still meditate. If you have fever, watch the heat element. So if you are sick, watch the part of the body that hurts, that pain. Just watch it as an object. Eh? You'll never know. You can get into very deep calmness and inside as you see the pain come and go. Right? Now, what do you do? Why? Well, again, old age counts a lot. So you should meditate when you are young. Don't always say that I retire, then only I meditate. When you retire, sometimes the mind lacks strength to meditate. Not enough energy that comes with old age. But do not give the excuse that you're old, you can't meditate. You're old, still can meditate. Every moment you note the rising and falling, how fantastic. You have accumulated so great merits. For that moment when you rise and fall, your mind is pure. When you're rising, for a second moment you rise and fall, your mind is so pure. Why? Because when mindfulness there in your rising and falling, in that two moments when it rises and falls, the mind is absence of defilements. There's no greed, no hatred, no delusion. So the mind is pure. So every moment, in half an hour, even ten times, you get that rise and fall clearly. Your mind is pure ten times. So don't give the excuse that you can't meditate because you're old. Still, we meditate. Only thing is, it is a bit more difficult because we don't have that much energy. But, if you meditate young and when you grow old, you still have the energy. Maybe a little bit of difference. But because the mind has already developed a lot of mental energy when you are young, so you are able to Maintain that energy, mental energy, even though the body gets old, but the mind still has a lot of energy. As the saying goes, the body is old, but the mind is young. Right now, eh? you are as old as you think you are. Something that life begins at 50. <laughs> you only live eh? when you're at 50 because another five years you retire, then you enjoy. <laughs> Well, that is a state of mind, right? You are as old as you think you are. Now, he knows how the discarding of sloth and topper comes to be. So in your, that is what experience meditator is all about. You know how it comes about, you know how it goes away, how to discard it. 
So that is how you become experienced. You try this way, try that way, try this way, try that way, and until you get the right way. So how do you discard it? Do walking meditation. When you feel very sleepy, stand up, intention, standing, standing. And standing meditation is good. You won't fall asleep. Right or not? When you stand, you can't put your forehead down on the floor. That's for sure. Right or not? Eh? So you, you got to shake and you wake you up. When you get sleepy, tang, like that. Oh, then you stay straight up again. So in other words, when you're sleepy, your body starts to sway. Then you not swaying, 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 then you stand again. Then you feel the hardness on the floor. Hardness, hardness, earth element. And sometimes when you do your standing, your rising and falling become very clear. Put your hand on your abdomen. So feel the rising, falling in your standing meditation. Then you won't fall asleep. Or do your walking meditation. Unless you sleepwalk. <laughs> Otherwise you won't, won't fall asleep. Eh? Lifting, pushing, lifting, pushing. Brings out the energy. As you walk, it brings out the energy, physical energy, conditioned mental energy. Right? So that will overcome sloth and topper. Meditating in bright places, in bright lights, when you feel awake. And then wash your face if you really feel sleepy. Don't meditate uh, too near bed times. Rubbing your hands and feet. So even the Buddha recommend, uh, rub your ear loop. Some say not even rub, it doesn't work, they press it. But I don't recommend too drastic action. So you rub, 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 keeps you awake. I don't know whether it works or not. One of these days you try it. When you feel very sleepy, eh? uh, you take two hands and rub your ear loop. Uh, see whether you stay awake after you rub. But I do think that if you rub your face, it helps. Rub your hand, makes it warm, rub your face then you suddenly feel quite awake. It helps. It helps. Now, touching point, more objects for meditation, then it keeps you awake. More energy. Eh? If you don't want to walk, you want to sit, then go for touching, touching, touching. But don't, so, don't go so slow. Go a bit faster. Mind has work to do, then it keeps awake. Right? Now, if you watch the sleepiness closely, like head dropping, heaviness on the forehead, discomfort, probably you bring out the mindfulness and then it will overcome the sleepiness. Now, if all else fail, what do you do? Everything you do also cannot, uh, then better go and sleep. Lah. Go and take a short sleep, but don't sleep whole day. When you wake up, the moment you wake up, sit up, rising, falling, rising, falling. So, these are some way of overcoming sloth and topper. Right? And knowing how it won't come again. Well, knowing how it won't come again. When you are feel sleepy when meditate, then don't work so hard. You know that if you don't work so hard uh, in the daytime and when you sit, then you won't feel that sleepiness. Things like that. But of course, you need to be an arahan, <laughs> fully attained uh, to get rid of sloth and topper. Sloth and topper is the last to go. Is the last to go. Even Sotopan feel sleepy. First state of sainthood, second and third state of sainthood, uh, they also feel uh, sleepy when they meditate. So you're not the only one. So don't get disturbed. Eh? Don't get annoyed. Eh? So you're not the only one. Even saints fall asleep. Eh? When they meditate, they still have sloth and topper. Only arahans. Uh, when they meditate, they don't have that sloth and topper. Tinamida. 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 Uh, udacha is the same. Uh, restlessness of mind. Only an arahan do not have restlessness of mind.